Minister. Praise the Lord, everybody. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord tonight? I love what uh, Jared said earlier. The kingdom of God is a big place, and we're just a little part of that. But I tell you what, I want to be faithful in everything that God has called me to do. How many would say amen? And uh, you know what we like to say around here? When we take care of the kingdom, the king of the kingdom will take care of us. How many would say amen? When we take care of God's house, I believe God will take care of our house. How many would say amen? Praise the Lord. Didn't our bishop do a good job this morning preaching the word? Amen. That was a good word this morning. And you know, uh, I just, I, I think, I think too many times in the church, we don't celebrate our differences enough. Everybody know what I'm talking about? Let, let me just blow somebody's mind right now. It's our diversity that makes us strong. Hello? I said it's our diversity. If we were all the same cookie-cutter way, how many know we'd be boring tonight? A bunch of Steve's standing around in jeans and a suit. Come on, somebody. But thank God for diversity. Somebody say thank God for diversity. And how many just want to be everything that God has called you to be? Amen. Amen. I can remember when I first started ministering, uh, you know, I, I, I had good intentions, but obviously uh, dad had a bit of big influence on uh, my ministry and so on and so forth. And when I started ministering, you know, that, that desire was there to want to wanna please my father and, and do good for him, you know, and I, and I struggled th with this at first, you know, who, who am I as a minister, you know, and I'm trying to be like this one and I'm trying to be like that one, but you know, then I finally figured it out, you know, I, I just got to be who God has called me to be. And I remember praying about this and just, I was in my study one time and uh, this is what the Lord told me. And you know, because I, I know the old school, we kind of think if we preach harder that we're preaching better, but uh, the Lord said this, he said, don't preach harder, preach smarter. And I thought, okay, Lord, that's good. That sounds good. It's, it rhymes. So it must be from you because I'm not a poet. Uh, come out of the Proverbs or Song of Solomon or something. But I was like, Lord, give me a scripture of that. If that's true, if that's what, if that's what you're really speaking to me, preach smarter, not just harder. And the Lord gave me this verse. He said, I want you to be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. Ooh. So ever since then, I've just been trying to be my, who God has called me to be. And uh, how many understand that's who we've got to be? Yeah. Amen. All right. I have a question here tonight that I want to uh, propose to you as we get started with the message. And uh, I, I, I have never preached anything like this, nor have I ever heard anything like this. And I just thank God for fresh manna. How many would say amen? amen? There was a time, again, when I was preaching and I would struggle for messages. I mean, can I just be real? I, I don't know if it was a lack of, yeah, okay. Yeah, lack of personal study on my part of, of relationship with the Lord, so on and so forth. But, you know, you just kind of go through those times when you struggle. But that's not the case anymore. Man, I, I tell you what, I've got messages stacked up on one another at home that I want to preach. And I've got some good messages coming up if the Lord uh, will allow me to preach them. But uh, where was I going with that? <laughs> but, uh, you know, sometimes the Lord just wants us to think, doesn't he? Hello? I mean... Because the Bible says we work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, I, I appreciate the ministry. I, I appreciate the fivefold ministry, and that was God's idea. Somebody say that was God's idea. Man didn't make the church. God instituted the church. And so that's why we've got to take the church with all our faults, and we've just got to go and make the best of it, don't we? And so... Uh, God instituted the church. God ordained the church. He put the fivefold ministry within the church for the edification of the body, so on and so forth. But sometimes I think God challenges us, doesn't he? He wants us to think. He wants us to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. The Bible says we are to, to study to show ourselves approved. Amen? 
So I want to make you think here this, this evening. And the question is this. Would you have rather been Job or Samson? Now think about it. Get the wheels to turning. Let's go back to Sunday school and let's, let's remember the teachings about Job. Let's remember the teachings about Samson. And, and don't, don't, don't answer out loud, but just think about this. It's, it's some food for thought as we get into the message. Would you have rather been Job or Samson? Turn with me, if you would, please, to the book of Joel, the second chapter. How many is thankful for the word of God tonight? Hopefully we can answer that question by the end of the message tonight. <clears throat> I need to remember Sister Beulah in prayer. She has really been struggling lately with pain in her body. And so let's lift up Sister Beulah in our prayers. Joel chapter 2, verse 23. And it reads, Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain moderately. And he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. In other words, the former and the latter rain together. Or the double portion. Everybody say the double portion. And the floor shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore. Everybody say, and I will restore. Now, this is the prophet Joel speaking here, but he's, he's speaking on the behalf of God because he is the prophet. Everybody say the prophet. He says, And I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that has dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I, the Lord your God, and none else and my people shall never be ashamed. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We ask you to anoint, it, to anoint us, anoint our ears to hear. We thank you for your goodness and grace and mercy. And we give you all praise and honor and glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen, amen. and amen. Now once again, the Lord speaks to the prophet Joel here in verse 25 and says this. And I will restore to you... The years that the locust has eaten, the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. Now let's just go there tonight real quickly. If God is speaking here through the prophet Joel, and how many believe that God is speaking through the prophet Joel? If he is saying that he will restore, which he says he is, and I believe he will, but he goes on to say, in describing the locust, the canker, the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, he goes on to say, my great army which I sent among you. Hmm. Everybody go, hmm. I want us to get our thinking caps on tonight. My great army which I sent among you. But notice here how God says to and through Joel... I will restore to you. Can we say it like this? God will restore to me. God will restore to me. The title of our message tonight is simply this, The God of Restoration. Everybody say, The God of Restoration. How many understand He's a God of many great things? And one of the great and mighty things that He does for us human beings is He restores us the God of restoration. Now, first of all, let me ask this. What does it mean to restore, to restore something or to be restored? Let me give you some book form definitions of the word restore. Number one is this, to return to its original or usable and functioning condition. How many have ever restored a piece of furniture, a car? It's gratifying, isn't it? to restore that thing, whatever it is, back to its original state, its original condition. Number two, to return to life, to get or give new life or energy. We're talking
talking about the word restore, restoration. How about this, number three, to give or to bring back? How about this, number four, to restore by replacing a part or putting together what is torn or broken. How many can say that God has restored some things in your life? Woo. Yes. Yes and amen. And then finally, the fifth one, and I love this, to bring back into original existence or use or function or position. Woo. Now, I, I want you to think about the way man was created in the Garden of Eden. We were perfect. Hello? Man was created in the image and the likeness of God. Man was perfect. Man knew no sickness, no disease. Come on, somebody. He fellowshiped with God in the cool of the day. He was to live forever in his perfect state. How many believe God wants to restore us back to that position? Of How many understand God gave Adam all power and authority over everything in the world? Wow, think about that. But I love this final definition. To bring back into original existence, use, function, or position. Now, how many would be honest here this evening and say that there are some things in your life that need to be restored? That God has restored some things, but yet there are things yet to be restored. How many would say amen? I think we can all say that. Possibly a relationship or a wounded heart, a marriage, peace of mind, joy, trust, wasted years. There are many possible things that could need restoration in our lives. Well, I've got good news for us tonight because we serve the God of restoration. How many names say amen? Look at your neighbor tonight and say, we serve the God of restoration. That's our God. That's our God. That's just one of the many things he does for us. Now let me ask another question here. How many would say that there are some things in your lifetime that you have wasted? Hello? Yeah. Some time, talent, energy, even money. Yeah. We've, we've, we've all wasted away some things. And that leads us to our next point here. The things that need to be restored in our lives, I believe, fall into two categories. And those two categories are this. First of all, the things that the devil has stole from us. And secondly, the things we have given up willingly. Let me say it again. The things that are in our lives that need restored, I believe they fall into two categories. Things that the devil has stole from us and things that we have given up willingly. So first of all here tonight, let's talk about the things the devil has stole from us. Has the devil stole anything from anybody here tonight? Not what we have given up willingly, but things the devil has unlawfully come in and stole from us. I want to get you thinking here tonight. Turn with me to Job chapter 1. Now remember, remember the question. Would we rather be Job? Or would we rather be Samson? Job chapter 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 she-asses, and a very great household. So that this man was the greatest, everybody say the greatest. the greatest. This man was the greatest of all the men of the East. And he was a God-fearing man. Isn't that an awesome thing? And his sons went and feasted in their houses every one his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And it, and it was so that when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them 
and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. Now, that, that describes the greatness of Job. But look at, look at this, what we could title as Satan's request. Verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? In other words, where have you been, Satan? And then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Now notice this here, because God himself take, takes the initiative and kind of uh, sets Job out here. And the Lord said unto Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that fears God and eschews evil? Well, then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for naught? In other words, is he just serving you for the loaves and fishes and all the blessings? Have you not made a hedge about him and about his house? And about all that he has on every side, you have blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thy hand now, and this is the devil still talking to, to God about Job. Put forth thy hand now, and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. Wow. Wow. So Satan was using Job to challenge God. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power, only upon himself, put not forth your hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Verse 13, and there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating, speaking of Job here, there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house, and there came a messenger, messenger unto Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the asses feeding behind, beside them. And the Sabians fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain or killed the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God has fallen from heaven and has burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I only am escaped alone to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away. Yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. And you thought you were having a bad week. Come on, somebody. I mean, really. Really? And while, yet, and while he was yet speaking, verse 18, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they were dead. And I am only escaped alone to tell thee. Now, that was Job's affliction. Now let's see what Job's reaction was. Verse 20. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground. And what did he do? And he worshipped. Everybody say, and he worshipped. And he worshipped. And he said this, Naked came, out, came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. I want you to notice that verse 22, very powerful. In all this, in all this great affliction, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. So we see here in Job chapter 1, the things that the devil stole from Job. How many understand it's the devil's business to come to steal, kill, and to destroy? That's what he does. Everybody say, that's what he does. That's what he does, and he does, he does a good job of it. But we see here, 
the things the devil stole from Job. And we know these were things that the devil himself stole from Job because the devil had to ask God's permission to do so. Hello? Now think about this. We can know this was of the devil's doings because the devil asked God if he could do this. Now, what I'm about to say here is, is sometimes a point of confusion or even argument. But some say that Job brought this on himself. And the reason why they say that is because of what Job chapter 3 says. Let's look at that here. Job chapter 3, verse 25. Job chapter 3, verse 25. For the thing, and this is Job speaking about himself here, for the thing which I greatly feared is come upon me, and that which I was afraid of is come unto me. So because of this one verse, there are those who believe that Job brought this calamity on himself. Because of the fact that Job says, the thing which I greatly feared is come upon me. There are those who believe Job sinned and missed God, and so God allowed Satan to nearly destroy him. Now, if that's the way you see it tonight, that's fine. You're entitled to your belief. But personally, I don't see it that way. And let me give you some reasons why, or better, let, better yet, let me give you some scriptures why I don't believe that's the case. Look at this in Job chapter 1, verse 1. In describing the man called Job, it says this. There was Job 1.1. 1, 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was what? That man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. Now, that's a very powerful statement. How many would say amen? Very, very powerful statement. But let's look a, a little further here. And let's see what God himself has to say about Job. Remember the meeting in heaven between uh, Satan and God? Job chapter 1, verse 8. Look at it here. Job 1, 8. And the Lord said, everybody say the Lord said. And the Lord said unto Satan, Have you considered my servant Job that there is none? Everybody say there's none. There is none like him in the earth. And remember, this is God speaking here. A perfect and an upright man, one that fears God and eschews evil. Now, when God calls you a perfect man, I would say you're doing something right. How many would say amen? I mean, really. When God says you're a perfect and an upright man, I, I think you got something going on for you. And so my thinking is this. If Job sinned and missed God because he feared something, then why would God ever call him perfect and upright? Hello? And not only that, but if Job sinned and missed God because he feared something, then why did the devil have to go get God's permission to torment him? Hello? Hello? I want you to think about this tonight. Come on. You see, I believe that there are only two ways that the devil can afflict us. First of all, if we sin and purposely walk away from God, then how many understand that we are open prey for the enemy? Open prey for the devil. If we turn our backs on God, then I believe God will lift his hand of protection off of us. How many believe that way? And that's what America has to remember, goodness, we're going to pay the piper. How many know that? But you see, that's, that's one way the devil can clean our clock, so to speak. But the only other way the devil can touch us is if we reach a level of such spiritual maturity that God trusts us to endure some stuff. Hello? 
I believe we can reach a level of spiritual maturity when God will look at us and say, have you considered my servant Job? Wow. Everybody say wow. You see, that's what he said about Job. And, and, and I don't know, sometimes, can I just be real? Sometimes it seems as if God does some things that doesn't really seem fair. I, am I the only one that struggles with that sometimes? We're going to preach a message here, the Lord willing, about Moses and pastors. And I tell you what, some things happened to Moses that really didn't seem fair. But how many know our God is a just God? He is sovereign. And His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And so uh, God is large and in charge. How many would say amen? And so anyway, that, that's why I choose to believe that Job did not sin, but rather he reached a place of such spiritual maturity where God himself could put him to the test. Now, we need to understand something here because God will try us. God will allow us to be tested, but God will never tempt us. Amen? Amen? God will try us. He will allow us to be tested, but he will never tempt us with sin. The Bible plainly says that God will never tempt us to sin, but we sin when we are led away by our own lust. Amen? And so that's just some good uh, teaching for us tonight. You can just kind of put that in there as extra. But now back to restoration. Everybody say restoration. Restoration, and the, and the whole thing about this is the church that you and I are a part of tonight, we are in the process of being restored back to the church's original condition in the book of Acts. How many would say amen? The last days actually started on the day of Pentecost when the early church was birthed. And how many know we got our work cut out for us? But that's all right. We serve a big God, and he is in the process of restoring us. Would somebody say praise the Lord? Praise Woo! How many are thankful for restoration tonight? And so there are two categories in which things that need to be restored in our lives fall into. Number one, things the devil has stole from us, and things we have given up, we have given up willingly. And so we see here tonight with Job that the devil stole everything he had. He stole his livelihood, his livestock, his family, his, could we say he stole his peace of mind, his joy? I mean, because if you read there, boy, I tell you what, Job, Job went through some stuff, didn't he? But thank the Lord, the God whom Job served was a God of restoration. How many would say amen? amen? And to make a long story short, I want you to look here at Job chapter 42. And we're just going to jump right to the end. And maybe if you get a chance this week, you could read the book of Job in your, in your reading. But Job chapter 42 verse 10. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job. Everybody say, the Lord did it. Really, the Lord set Job up because he asked the devil, have you considered my servant Job? But here we find the Lord stepping in and saying, okay, you know what, this is enough. The Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his pr friends. Also, watch this now, the Lord gave Job twice as much, everybody say twice as much, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then came there unto him all his brethren and all his sisters and all they that had been in the acquaintance before and did eat bread with him in his house and they bemoaned him and comforted him over all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. Every man also gave him a piece of money and every one an earring of gold. Verse 12, so the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. For he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 
she asses. Now, if you go back to chapter 1, you will see that that was double of everything that he had before. Verse 13. He had also seven sons and three daughters. And he called the name of the first. And if you can pronounce all of Job's daughters' names, go right on ahead. But I'm not going to. <laughs> Verse 15. And in all the land were no women found so fair as the daughters of Job. And their daughter gave them inheritance among their brethren. After this, everybody say after this. After the complete restoration, Job lived 140 years and saw his sons and his sons' sons, even four generations, and so Job died being old and full of days. Wow. Somebody say wow. wow. That's the God of restoration. But can I tell you it didn't happen overnight? I should have looked that up to see how much time, yeah, what the time period was in there. Forgive me for not doing that. Somebody want to Google that real quick? You can probably Google that. <laughs> Uh, but I tell you what, we talked about this last week. The wills of God grind slow, but they grind sure. And God will seemingly to take forever just to do something suddenly. Hello? Woo! Nudge your neighbor and say, be ready. Get ready. Because God can change your situation just like that. So we see here that the God whom Job served is, was a God of restoration even when the devil came to steal, kill, and to destroy. Can somebody say praise the Lord? And in the case of Job, God completely and totally restored Job. But now the second category of restoration is this. The things that we have gi given up willingly. How many know we've all given up some stuff willingly? The things we have given up willingly. Now let's go to Judges chapter 16. How many have ever been your own worst enemy before? Yes? Like Barney Five shooting yourself in the foot? Yeah, we've all been there and done that. But remember the question. Would, would, would we have rather been Job or Samson? Now Samson, how many know Samson did some mighty cool things? You know, I, I think us all of us guys, we think, man, I'd like to be like Samson. Woo, I mean... He did some stuff. And let's read about it here. Uh, Judges chapter 16, verse 1. Then went Samson to Gaza, and there was a harlot, and went in unto her. Hmm. Make, kind of reminds me of a message I preached one time. When God wants to bless you, he sends a person into your life. When the devil wants to destroy you, he sends a person into your life. Listen to this. When Samson, then went Samson to Gaza, and there was a harlot, and he went into her. And it was told the uh, Gazites, saying, Samson is come hither. And they compassed him in and laid wait for him all night in the gate of the city and were quiet all the night, saying, in the morning... When it is day, we shall kill him. And Samson lay till midnight, and arose at midnight, and took the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts, and went away with them, bar and all, and put them up on his shoulders, and carried them up to the top of the hill that is before Hebron. Wow, Samson was a bad dude, wasn't he? I mean, he was pretty tough. Verse 4, And it came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. Everybody say Delilah. Delilah. Boy, and I bet she was something beautiful, wasn't she? Even her name sounds beautiful, Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and said unto her, Entice him, meaning Samson, and see wherein his great strength lies and by what means we may prevail against him, that we may bind him to afflict him, and we will give you, every one of us, 1,100 pieces of silver. Wow. That would have been worth a lot of money. 
And Delilah said to Samson, Tell me, I pray thee, wherein is your great strength, where it lies, and wherewith you might be bound to afflict you. And Samson said unto her, If they bind me with seven green withs that were never dried, then shall I be weak and be as another man. Then the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven green widths which uh, had not been dried, and she bound him with them. Now there were men lying in wait, abiding with her in the chamber, and she said unto them, The Philistines be upon you, Samson. And he broke the widths as a thread of tow is broken when it touches the fire, so his strength was not known. And Delilah said unto him, Samson, behold, you have mocked me, and told me lies. Now tell me, I pray thee, wherewith uh, thou mightest be bound. And he said unto her, If they bind me fast with new ropes that were never occupied, then shall I be weak, even as another man. Delilah therefore took new ropes and bound him therewith, and said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And there were liars wait, uh, in wait abiding in the chamber, and he brake them off his arms like a thread. And Delilah said unto him, Samson, hitherto thou hast mocked me and told me lies. Tell me wherewith thou mightst be bound. And he said unto her, If thou weavest the seven locks of my head with the web. And she fastened it with the pin and said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awaked out of his sleep and went away with the pin of the beam and with the web. Now, I don't know, I don't know about you, but if I'm Samson, he was obviously brawn and no brains. How many would say amen? Yeah, okay, let's just leave it at that. Yeah. Yo, Adrian. <laughs> yeah, Rocky, Rocky Balboa. All brain, all brawn, no brains. Verse 15. And she said unto him, How can thou say I love you? Okay, here we go now. Here, here, here's where it's Delilah cuts to the quick. And she said unto him, How can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me these three times and have not told me wherein your great strength lies. Uh-oh, Samson's in trouble now, isn't he? And it came to pass when she pressed him Daily. Ooh. Poor Samson. Yeah. And it came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him so that his soul was vexed even unto death. Wow. Okay, now I almost feel sorry for Samson again, right? No, not, not really. Verse 17. That he told her all his heart, and said unto her, There has not come a razor upon my head. Now, let me just stop right there. I can't go on without saying this. Church, that's why we, we can never give place to the devil. The Bible says resist the devil and he will flee. You know the Bible says we're supposed to flee temptation? A good rule of thumb is this. Don't go where you can't stand. Hello? Hello? Don't go where you can't do the right thing. How many would say amen? And, and sometimes we're our own worst enemy. We just put ourselves in situations and circumstances that we're not going to succeed in. And how many know just because we love something doesn't make it right? How many know we can love the wrong thing? Hello? All right. That he told her all his heart, verse 17, and said unto her, There has not come a razor upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. And if I be shaven, everybody say, uh-oh, here we go. If I be shaven, then my strength will go from me, and I will become weak and be like any other man. Hmm. And when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up this once, for he has showed me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and brought money in their hand. Isn't it funny that even the enemy knew that Samson wasn't lying anymore? Here comes the money. Wow. Wow. Verse 19. And she made him sleep upon her knees, or in other words, he put his head in her lap, 
And she called for a man, and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head, and she began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. Now, I, I noticed something here in this reading that I'd never noticed before. Delilah went ahead and began to afflict him. She didn't even wait for the Philistines, but she began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. And she, and she said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he woke up out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. Now wait a minute, Samson. What are you thinking? You didn't tell her the, the source of your strength before, but this time you did. How do you think you can go out and get away with sin? Oh, come on, somebody. Hmm. I will go out as other times before and shake myself, and he wist not, or in other words, he didn't realize that the Lord had departed from him. But the Philistines took Samson and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with fetters of brass, and he did grind in the prison house. Wow. Wow. So we see here tonight that after some relentless coercing by Delilah that Samson willingly gave up the secret of his great strength. Now this was one very painful and hard lesson for Samson to learn. How many would say amen? You see what Job had to endure was nothing to sneeze at, was it? Nothing to laugh at. But yet, because Job didn't willingly give things up, Job was totally restored and enjoyed a great life for many years to come. Now, I want to show you something here. But you see, when we willingly, everybody say willingly, when we willingly give things up, when we willingly, repeatedly, sell ourselves out to the highest bidder or the best looking harlot. Come on, somebody. When we willingly go against God and do the wrong thing, when we repeatedly give up those things that we should be holding on to, we must remember that full restoration may very well elude us. In other words, if we willingly and continually give things up and do the wrong things, then God isn't required to give us full or total restoration of all things. In fact, let's look at what partial restoration looks like. Judges 16, chapter 21. But the Philistines took Samson and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza, and bound him with fetters of brass, and he did grind in the prison house. Howbeit the hair of his head began to grow again after he was shaven. Well, that makes sense. Verse 23. Then the lords of the Philistines gathered them together for to offer a great sacrifice unto Dagon, their God, and to rejoice, for they said, Our God has delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hand. And when the people saw him, they praised their God, for they said, Our God has delivered into our hands our enemy and the destroyer of our country, which slew many of us. And it came to pass, when their hearts were merry, that they said, Call for Samson, that he may make us sport. In other words, they're wanting to laugh at Samson. They're wanting to make fun of him. And they called for Samson, out of the prison house, and he made them sport, and he set, uh, and they set him between the pillars. And Samson said unto the lad that led, that held him by the hand, Suffer me, that I may fill the pillars whereupon the house stands, that I may lean upon them. Now the house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there. And there were upon the roof about 3,000 men and women, and behold, while Samson, that beheld while Samson made sport. Verse 28. And Samson 
called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me. In other words, Samson is praying a prayer of restoration. O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me, I pray thee, only this once. Hmm. Notice that. I, I pray thee, strengthen me only this once, O God that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood and on which it was borne up, and the one with his right hand and the other with his left. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might, and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people that were therein, so the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. Now church, hear me here because what I'm about to say is very powerful. How many understand that sometimes we can be so hard-headed, so stubborn, hello? Hello? That the only way God can work his process is to restore us and then take us out. Hmm. You see, Samson's strength was restored to him, but yet he had to pay for that restoration with his very own life. Church, can I tell you, it is God's plan that he took care of everything on the cross 2,000 years ago. How many would say amen? amen? But how many know sometimes the flesh gets in the way so much and we make a mess of things so much, come on somebody, that sometimes we have to pay for playing? Hello? Now I know. God can restore us. I know God can heal us. But listen, sometimes we have done so many things in our past where we're never going to get away from our past. Somebody's always going to remember what Steve did when he was young. Somebody's always going to bring up Troy's past or Brother Tom's past or Brother Dan's past. Come on, somebody. See, the devil is the accuser of the brethren. And the worst thing we can do as individuals is to be our own worst enemy. How many understand that Samson was his own worst enemy? Can I tell you Delilah wasn't his enemy? It was Samson. Samson. Samson was his own worst enemy. Samson's strength was restored, but yet he had to pay for that restoration with his very own life. How many understand that his restoration was already bought and paid for on the cross? But because of his stubbornness, because God possibly knew that if he totally restored Samson like he did Job, Samson still wouldn't have learned his lesson and there would have been another Delilah down the road. Hello? I'm just saying. I'm not saying dust say it the Lord. I'm just kind of inserting my own thinking right there. Now, I, I don't know about you, but the story of Samson makes me want to not give things up willingly. How many would say amen? I mean, seriously, when we stop and think about this and when we see the greatness of Samson and the power and the might and the supernatural strength that he had, it was amazing. But yet that wasn't enough for Samson. Remember the little message? being content with where I'm at on the way to where I'm going? Why can't we just be happy with who God has called us to be? Because contentment with godliness is great gain. Come on, somebody. Why do we always got to be pushing the envelope? Why do we, why do we always got to be towing the line and seeing what we can get away with? Come on, somebody. This is awful good preaching right about now. And I like to push the envelope. But listen, sometimes you just got to play it straight. How many would say amen? Right is right and wrong is wrong. 
But I don't want to be like Samson. I, I don't want to give things up willingly. Now, if I reach a certain level of maturity, and God can say, well, you know what? Have you considered my servant Steve? Then that's a whole other case. That's a whole other ballgame because the Bible says God will not put on us more than we can bear. And he knows how we're going to endure. It, the Bible says he knows the end from the beginning and the beginning from the end. So think about that. Now, I, I, hopefully I'm getting you to think here tonight, but I, I want us to end on a good note here. So we're not going to close with Samson, but I want us to close with Job. Let's quickly go back, and I'm, I'm closing here. Let's go back to Job, chapter 42, and verse 10. And I want to just show us a couple things here, and then we'll be done. Job, chapter 42, verse 10. Talking about the God of restoration tonight. But how many understand even God has limits? You say, well, now, well, wait a minute, Pastor. How, how could you say that? God has limits when we limit him. The Bible talks about the children of Israel. They limited the Holy One of Israel with their unbelief and disobedience. But Job chapter 42, verse 10, look at this. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Now notice that. The Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Look at your neighbor and ask him, are you ready to get double for your trouble? Hello? Are you ready to get double for your trouble? Remember what we always say? Where you pain is probably where you're going to reign. There's purpose in our pain. Are you ready to get double for your trouble tonight? Come on, somebody. Yeah. Woo! Look at this on Isaiah 61, 7. Isaiah 61, 7. For your shame, you shall have what? You shall have double. And for confusion, they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess the what? The double. Everlasting joy shall be unto them. Woo! Woo! Somebody who's been to hell and back and lived to tell about it, needs to be up on your feet shouting because you know what? You're going to get double for your trouble. Hello? Mm, 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 mm. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Help me, Jesus. I'm trying to quit. And then finally, one of the most needed restorations, I believe, in the church today is, is found here in Psalms chapter 51. Look at this. Psalms 51, verse 12. Restore unto me... The joy of thy salvation. Everybody say joy. joy. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Who's ready to get your joy back tonight? Hello? I said, who needs your joy back tonight? Who needs your joy restored? You see, we desperately need our joy back because the joy of the Lord is our strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And so no joy equals no strength. And no strength equals no victories. Woo! Look at your neighbor and say, you need your joy back. You need your joy back. I need my joy back. So now, here, here we go with the loaded question. Who would you rather have been? Job or Samson? Boy, that's, that's a mouthful. That's a mouthful. <laughs> oh, Lord, help me. <laughs> Woo! I mean, he was sitting on the ground scraping himself with a clay pot, wasn't he? Trying to scrape the boils off. Wow, did anybody find out how long that went on? Years. I'm sure it was years, sister. I'm sure it was years. But yet he worshipped. Yet he charged God not foolishly. Nor did he sin. Wow. Wow, I believe Job was... A righteous man, just like the Bible says, a perfect and an upright man. You see, Samson's strength was restored, but his eyesight wasn't. 
We seem to miss that in the story. We think, well, man, Samson went out with a blaze of fire. His strength was restored. He killed his enemies. But he paid for it with his life, and he never regained his eyesight. How many know as Christians, oftentimes we walk around spiritually blind to the things around us, to the truth, to revelation? But how many want to see everything that God has for you to see? How many want to hear everything that God for, has for you to hear? Hello? Come on, somebody. How many want to do everything that God has called you to do? How many want to go everywhere God has called you to go? You know what the Bible says about that? If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. Why? Because obedience is better than sacrifice. Samson's strength was restored, but his eyesight wasn't. Not only that, he had to die a shameful death with his own enemies. While on the other hand, Job was totally restored. Job was totally healed. Job was totally made whole. And then he got more than he ever had before. And then he lived 140 more years after being restored. Woo! Woo! God takes this restoration stuff serious. How many would say amen? Mm. Mm. So we could kind of maybe say it like this. Short-term pain, Job style, equals long-term pleasure. But short-term pleasure, Samson style, equals long-term pain. Now, church, let me say this, and I'm through. In both cases, God is still the God of restoration. How many would say amen? In both these cases, God is still the God of restoration. But I, I, I just want to say this about this short-term pain equals long-term pleasure. In the church today, we are hearing too much feel-good messages. And, and don't get me wrong, I believe God wants us healthy, wealthy, and wise. I believe God loves his children. He has only the best for us. But I believe in the church today, we're hearing too much about the goodness of God. The Bible says, behold, the goodness and the severity of God. We need to understand that the goodness of God is there. The blessings are there. The health is there. The strength is there. The prosperity is there. But can I tell you there are some rules. Everybody say rules. There are some rules in which we need to live by. Now, man, I got to quit because I'm about to go to meddling right here. But the new buzzword in some of the churches today is no rules. No rules. Now, hopefully, I, I, I'm trying to understand what they mean by this, and hopefully they mean well. Hopefully. You know, because don't, don't misunderstand me here. I'm not trying to be legalistic. I'm not trying to be Old Testament. I'm not trying to put us back under the law. Thank God for grace and mercy. How many would say amen? But can I tell you, oftentimes we make grace a disgrace. Grace is not a license to sin. Hello? I said grace is not a license to sin. Somewhere in the process of sanctification, we have to come to a place where the old man dies. Come on, somebody. And we live by this thing called the Word of God. Hello? And let me just go ahead and say this. If we are going to err, wouldn't it be best to err on the side of caution than on the side of foolishness? How many would say amen? amen. Now, I hope that's not a little too old school for you, but that's some good sound teaching right there. How many would say amen? amen. I would rather be safe than sorry. I, brother... Brother, brother Ray here, he, he, he comes down for prayer 
all the time. And brother, I'm not saying this to embarrass you by any means. But I would rather see somebody come down for prayer every service than to sit on their pew like a knot on wood. Hello? I would, come on, I would rather have to ride the altar to heaven than to ride the pew to hell any day. So what I'm saying is this. It all goes back to the fact that we have to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. And if you notice in our stories tonight, the Bible called and God called Job a perfect and an upright man. But notice how in Job chapter 1, Job was taking care of his spiritual business. He was praying. He was fasting. He was seeking God's face. He was making sacrifice for his own children. And, and yeah, he had to go through hell, but he was totally restored. He got double for his trouble. Come on, somebody. But see, Samson was the game player. Hello? Samson was the game player. Dabble here. Dabble. I, can, well, I can do this. I can get away with this. I can, you know, I can get down with Delilah for a little bit, but then I'll be all right because then I'll get back to church on Sunday. Come on, somebody. Help me preach this tonight. Mm. But Samson wasn't fully restored. He got his strength back. But he never got his eyesight back, and he had to pay with that restoration with his own life. He died a shameful death with his own enemies. Now, I know this is a big statement, but Lord help us. I'd rather be like Job than to be like Samson. Amen? The Bible says if we're faithful, if we endure to the end, and that's exactly what Job did. And because of that, God restored him, God healed him, God raised him up, God blessed him, gave him more than he had, gave him more sons, more daughters, daughters that I can't even pronounce their names. But that's just like our God because he's a God of restoration. How many would say amen? Let's stand together. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. And Father, we thank you that you are just constantly growing us, stretching our faith. Lord, you're just... Lord, you're asking us, God, to search out the deep things of the world.